in Los Angeles, and I had a talent of being able to write, uh, to produce music. And while I was there, it was great. Loved LA. Um, within six months, everybody in the city who did music knew who I was because I was really, really good at it. And everything was going great. Everything was, you know, just like I wanted it to be. I was getting offers, you know, to work with people, record contracts, things like that. So everything was working just like working out just like I wanted it to. So one night I'm in uh, Hollywood. It's a club called the Roxy and they had an industry music night. And I think it was like the third of every month or something like that. But all the major players in music were always there. Big entertainers, you know, people who had number one top 10 songs, they were always there at the Roxy. So I'm there with my cousin. He's a guy who's a musician. And while we're there, we had a great time. It was, you know, I loved LA. So we on the way back home and it's two o'clock in the morning and he and I get into an argument over getting a job. Uh, he's, he had a wife, he had a daughter, but he wouldn't get a job. And I used to ask him, why, why won't you do whatever, you know, his wife was the only one working. I said, why don't you try? And he would always say, God's going to bless me. God's going to bless me. And we got into an argument about it because my belief is the blessing is you're healthy. Uh, you don't have no problems, so you can get out and work. That's the blessing. And he didn't see it that way. He just saw it as God coming up and just knocking on his door and giving him a job. So we got into a big argument on the way home because I thought he was just being lazy with the fact that he had a wife and a daughter. So to end the argument, because he was always saying, God's going to bless me, God's going to bless me. I said, well, let's make a deal. Let's pray right now. If God shows up for me, you know, you win. But if he doesn't show up, you got to go out and start filling out some applications tomorrow. And he agreed. So long story short, he said, let's pray. So we start praying. And the next thing he says, let me hold your hand, which I was not agreeable to two guys. It's 2 a.m. in L.A. Didn't look right. But he was like, come on, man, you just got to hold hands. So we're holding hands. And he just starts praying. And, you know, I'm sitting back waiting for him to finish praying because, you know, it's getting late and I really wanted to rub his face in it. So he's still praying. And after a while, you know, I look over at him. His eyes are really tight together where the eyelids have wrinkles in it. He's really, really hard at praying. So I sit back and I'm waiting for him to, to get done. And. While I'm sitting there, I just close my eyes, you know, like waiting for him to go. It's 2.30 in the morning. And when I have my eyes closed, suddenly I just see white light just flash on my eyes. <sighs> I open my eyes like, what the heck was that? I don't know what it is, but I'm thinking, because I'm a very logical, rational person. So I said, well, the white light could be a car was probably coming down the street. It's two o'clock in the morning. It turned the corner. It's headlight shone into the car. And that's what I saw. So after I gave myself that logical understanding, I was OK. So I sat back. I'm still waiting on him to finish because I really want him to hurry up so I could rub his face in it. And while he's still praying, I'm sitting there. I'm relaxing. Next thing I hear is a strange noise. And it felt like something entered into my body and it was strange. I just felt like this fullness feeling like, for example, there's a water balloon and you fill it up with water and you could see it expanding. That's the kind of feeling it felt like on my flesh. And I could hear, hear a sound. It was like, Ooh. but it had a vibration. So, my skin is vibrating while I'm hearing the sound and I feel this fullness of my flesh expanding, you know, and I didn't know what it was, but it, it really freaked me out. So I yanked my hand from his while he was still praying. I get out of the car. My eyes are just wide open. He gets out after me and he's angry because he thinks I'm playing with him and playing a game. 
I don't want to tell him that I felt something because that means he's right. And I don't want him to be right. So I didn't say anything. And he's saying under his breath, see, that's what I'm talking about. Playing around, you know, I knew you weren't serious. I knew you weren't serious. And while he's saying that, I am freaking out inside because I felt something. I don't know what it was. It's creeping me out. And I'm trying to find a logical explanation. So all the while he's talking about me, you're you're playing man and you're playing with God and that kind of thing. I'm freaking out because I, I can't believe something actually happened because as much as I brought up a Christian, I didn't actually believe the story that there's really a God out there that comes inside of your body. I just didn't believe it. So while he's, you know, angry with me and walking to the house, I said, listen, I felt something. He said, what? I said, I felt something. I don't know what it was, but I felt something. And when I, when I said that to him, he, his eyes just lit up and he was just, he looked like he was overjoyed with happiness. And so we go inside the house and he's telling me the stories about how, you know, he first got saved and how he first felt the spirit of God. But all the while he's talking, I don't believe it. In my mind, the whole time he's talking, I'm not hearing him because I'm trying to find a logical, rational, scientific explanation to explain what I just felt. And while he's speaking, suddenly my eyes just get heavy. Tears just start welling up in my eyes. I start feeling this unbelievable feeling of sadness. And the next thing I know, I start crying and I can't stop. So I run out of his presence because I don't want him to see me crying. And I run out into the backyard. And when I get out to the backyard, I just start crying just uncontrollably crying like I've never done before in my entire life, just crying and crying and crying and crying. And I couldn't stop. As much as I tried to compose myself, I couldn't stop. And then after I started crying for probably about three minutes, I fell on my knees and I just kept crying. I just kept crying. And then when it was all over and I stopped crying, I remember the first words I said, God is real. And I stood on my feet and I didn't know what the heck happened. But while I was standing, I saw these two angels come down and they reached into my body and took what looked like me out. And they flew right up into the sky. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know I didn't know what that means. I was I, I didn't know what was happening. I was I was freaking out. And after I saw it, I started crying again. I just started crying and I just started crying. And I didn't know why. I, I, I didn't know anything about religion, so I, I didn't know. And so all I could hear was my cousin was yelling, hey, Damon is being saved. God's saving him. He's saved now. He's saved. And while he was saying this, I just didn't understand what was happening. And, and I was trying to accept this fact that it was saved, but I'd never experienced anything like that before. So I didn't know what to do. So then he calls me in the house and he starts talking. He's happy. He's celebrating. You know, he's done something great. He saved my soul. And the whole time I am out to lunch, my mind is just gone because I don't understand what's happening. So while he's talking, I listened to him for about an hour. Then I said, look, I just got to go lay down. I go into the room to lay down. And as I'm going to the room, I'm standing in the backyard and a vision comes into my eyes and I don't know how, but it's like I could see everything that just happened. And it's like an explanation showing me what happened. I'm, I could see myself standing there crying. And then I see these two angels come down these angels take my soul from my body and they fly up into the sky. And I don't know what that means. I don't know the significance of it. So I go into the room. I lay down. I go to sleep. But while I go to sleep, it was, I just feel fear the whole night. The whole night, I've never felt fear before going to bed before. But this night, I just felt, fe I just felt fear, just uncontrollable fear. And I didn't know why. It would take me a number of months before I realized why I was feeling this uncontrollable fear. And the reason I was feeling so much fear is because 
I wasn't alive anymore. My soul was gone. I was murdered. I was dead. And still alive at the same time. And I had no idea what kind of horror was about to be unleashed on me. So while I'm sleeping, I'm thinking everything's okay. I wake up maybe two hours later and I see people in my room walking. They're like, but they're not really there. They're dead people. And I can see them walking. I can see facial features, their clothing. They look like normal people. And while I'm looking at them, I, I don't know how I can see them. I don't know how it's possible. And then every now and then one will walk over to me with a rose, a red rose, and lay it on my bed and then walk out of the room. Another will come in and lay another red rose on my bed and then walk out. Another will come in and lay a bouquet of roses and then walk out. And I was like, I don't understand what this means. What is this? Then I see a, an individual come in in a robe, a white robe. And I can't see the face. But they're in a white robe, like, you know, the holy robes in pictures, of religious paintings. It's what it looked like. And I, I didn't understand what, what was happening. And as these individuals came in, I didn't, I didn't know what was happening. So I laid down, I closed my eyes, closed my eyes, closed my eyes, and I tried to go to sleep. And as I opened it, I could see more and more dead people just walking around while I was trying to sleep. And I was freaked out. And next thing I know, I just blacked out, just gone. Woke up the next day. I go outside. It's a sunny day. Of course, it's L.A. It's always a sunny day. I go outside and I'm thinking, I don't know what the heck happened last night, but I don't like it. I don't like it. I look in the mirror and my eyes are like wide open, like really wide, like real wide open, you know, like abnormally. Like I'm just in shock. And I think I walked around like that for at least two weeks. My eyes were just bugged out of my head. Complete shock. So when my family comes down, you know, they're like, hey, how you doing? Are you okay? I said, yeah, I, said, I don't know what happened. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So the difference is this time when I'm standing outside, I can see dead people walking. I see dead people everywhere. I look up in the sky and I see these bluish whitish silhouettes of humans but they're standing all over the sky they're all over rooftops they're on wires you know where birds sit on the telephone wires where the birds used to sit back in the day you would just see these humanoid silhouettes of people everywhere and and i was like what's happening what what am i seeing so i'm trying to find out from my cousin what this is he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's been a religious person for 25 years and everything I'm telling him, he doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. He says, I don't know what your experience is. I haven't experienced anything like that. So I'm freaked out. So I'm asking him, what do I do? He tells me to go to church, find out about the Lord. So I start going to church, start going to church four days a week. And I was going to church four days a week. I, I started going to everybody's church. It didn't matter, Methodist, uh, Pentecostal, Baptist. It didn't matter, Catholic. I went to every church just to find out what is God? What, what is it? So I did this for probably a month. Maybe I was actually about 26 days. And after the 26th day, I realized everybody had a different view of the same word of God. For example, I'd hear the book of John. And everybody, every pastor, every minister, every priest had a different story to tell about the exact same book. And I didn't understand if it's the word of God, it should be uniform. Everybody should have the exact same explanation. But my cousin told me everybody has a different spirit. So you see something different. And I didn't know whether to believe that. So I started reading the Bible for myself. So right around, this happened August 4th, 1993. So right around September 20th, 
September 15th, somewhere around there, I read the Bible for myself. And I read page one to page 2,218. Those are the pages in my Bible. Page one, page 2,218. So I read the whole book cover to cover. And when I got done reading it, the first words that came out of my mouth when I closed it was, there's a God higher than what we know. I was amazed after I read the Bible. That's what I learned. And it's amazing because the Bible is full of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, Jesus. And yet when I read the whole thing, the thing I realized was there's a God higher than what we know. And when I made that understanding, I didn't understand how I knew that just from reading it. So I went back and I opened the Bible and I started reading it again, chapter by chapter. But the second time I read it, it was like I was grading a fourth grader's paper. With each chapter, I would read it. No, this shouldn't go here. This shouldn't be this. That's not the answer to this. So as I went through the whole book, that's the way I read it. This should be over here. This should be that. No, this shouldn't go here. And then I got to the book of Revelation, which is, you know, a book that, I didn't know that everybody didn't understand. I didn't know that because I didn't know anything about religion. So when I got to Revelation, I just started organizing. This shouldn't be here. This book should be over here. This should be this. this. No, this shouldn't go here. This is too much from Daniel. This is too much from Jesus. Take this and move this over. Now it makes sense. When I had reorganized the entire book and it made complete sense, then I closed it. And then I felt like I understood God. And once I felt like I knew God, I began devoting myself to him. And that created a problem, but I wouldn't know that until later because I devoted myself to him in the way I thought I should to be accepted to God. So the Bible tells you, you know, to fast and pray for God. So the one thing that you learn about religion is the Hebrew standard is very different from our standard today. Uh, the Middle East standard of fasting is basically sun up to sundown is one day. Whereas in the United States, we believe 24 hours is a day, which is basically, you know, night and day together. That makes one day. So for the Middle East standard versus the United States stand standard is very different which means they can fast for two days, but in the United States, it's actually just one day. So I started trying to devote myself to God and I thought the best way. So I would fast and pray and I would read and study and I would pray every day. But I would fast and pray all week. So in fasting and praying, you, can, you don't have to eat, you can't eat anything, but you can still drink. So I tried to make myself more worthy to God so I didn't eat or drink. So for the first day, I wouldn't eat or drink anything. I would just meditate, pray, and read. Second day, I wouldn't eat or drink anything, meditate, pray, and that's it. So the third day, I would do the same thing. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. I wouldn't eat, anything, eat or drink anything for seven days straight, eat or drink. And then on the eighth day, I would eat like a normal day. And that may go for two or three days of that. Then I'd start fasting and praying again. And I would start again with day one, no food or drink of any kind. Second day, no food or drink of any kind. Third day, no food or drink. So I would do this again for a full seven days. So I started doing this for at least three times a month for the next two months. And during this time, you know, I would never let anyone know that I was fasting and praying. So sometimes I wouldn't eat or drink anything for four days straight. My cousin would say, hey, let's go play some basketball. So I'd go out and play basketball with him for a couple of hours and I would get done. I'd come home, still wouldn't eat or drink anything because I was only on day number four and I had three more days to go. So I did this over and over and over. And I thought I was making myself holy to God because I was doing this to show that I was devoting myself to God. So upon this, I started creating other things. I started creating sacraments 
that I thought were, would be holy to God. I started creating all these different things during the same time. I started learning all these different perceptions. And then I learned something about God. Because I went to bed and I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw myself walking. And then I saw I had my, my own face, but I had the body of a camel. And I didn't understand what that meant. But what it meant was those in the afterlife, what we call angels, thought it was not normal for a man to be able to go this number of days without water and be able to do these things without water. And so I began developing a different point of view of the afterlife and what we call angels because this showing me as a camel really sounds like they're making fun of me. It's not sounding like, you know, we're acknowledging your devotion. It sounds like ridicule. But then I started creating these sacraments that I thought would be beautiful for God. And I'm not supposed to mention them because there's sacraments that you can create in the world that actually make you more powerful. It makes your spirit more powerful. It makes knowledge come to you faster. So I started creating these things. And as I created them, I started noticing that I was getting smarter and stronger. But I also started noticing a different behavior from dead people and angels that would come see me. They seemed to be more aggressive, violent, and I didn't understand why. But it all comes to the way you devote yourself to God. If you go beyond a standard that people believe is holy and you go beyond that, you don't make them love you. You create enemies for yourself because you're showing up others in the afterlife that have set that standard and then they begin to turn on you. And I didn't know that. And after I understood it, I went outside. It was dusk. And I went to a track where I used to go every night to jog. Uh, Southwest College is the name. And it has a big giant hill overlooking the track. So I go out there to do my daily jog. And while I'm jogging, I have my headphones on. I'm listening to religious broadcasts telling me about the glory of Jesus. So while I'm walking, you know, on a rest, and I'm walking around the track, I look over and there's this real high mountain that's above everything. And all of a sudden I look over there, I see a, a man standing on the hill by himself and he's just full of light, just full of light. And he has a robe on and he's just glowing. And I'm looking around to see if any, there's other people walking the track. I'm like, do they see this? Nobody appeared to see him. So I thought maybe I'm just freaking out. So I ignored it. But the next day I went to the track, I was walking and that same man appeared again and he was full of light. And I was like, what, what is this? So I got off the track. I walked all the way over there, walked up that hill and it was just a real flat plain of land. But if you walk all the way over to the other side, it's an elevation that's huge. It's like a mountain. If you can see the traffic below it, it's, you know, probably 900 feet higher than the rest of the traffic. So it's really high up there. So while I'm standing there, I don't know where that man is. I don't see him. So I start walking the, the length of this field. It's just an open field. And then I looked up and suddenly the clouds just start swirling. Like it looked like a, it looked like water going down a drain. Only the clouds were just swirling and swirling like going down a drain. And then when I saw this, it's like beings started coming out of it. And they came down on the ground and I, I was like, well, what's happening? What, what, what is this? And when they came down, they, they were like angels that you see in a painting, only you couldn't really see their facial features because they're full of light. And when they came down, they weren't like six feet tall. They were more like 
eight, nine feet tall. They were huge. And when they came down, I looked at them and I didn't know what to do. And the Bible says, you know, in your presence of, of holiness, you, you bow. So I got on my knees and they walked over to me and they motioned with their hands, stand up. So I stood up and they pointed and I just started walking. And as I started walking, they walked with me, one on each side of me. And I walked the length of the field. Then I turned around and walked back the second way. So as I walked in my mind, I'm saying, this is not real. This is my mind. I am becoming crazy. This can't be real because it's not real. They can't be real. So as I walked, I started listening. I could hear their footsteps hitting the floor. I could hear the grass. I could hear the thicket underneath their sandals as they stepped. And I was like, how am I hearing this if it's not real? How, how, how is this possible? So they walk with me the whole day. When the sun started going down around seven o'clock, they would leave. They would just go up into the sky. And the next day I would come at the same time, it was probably around five in the evening when the sun started going down. I would come around five and the sky would open and they would come back down again. Only this time, this great large presence of a being came down and he was big, huge. And, and I didn't know who it was. And when he came down, I would start walking again and I would walk with this great being for the whole five to seven, seven o'clock. And then when the sun went down, he would go up in the sky and every day I would go to that same place right when the sun gets ready to go down and this being would come down and I would walk with him. And we did this for about four or five months. And as I walked with him, he would say, speak. And then I would start, you know, didn't know what to say, but I start reciting the Bible verses that I read in the Bible and I would just speak. So every day he would tell me to speak and I would speak and we would just walk. And sometimes I would recite the same verses four or five times over and over. And every time I would stop, he would say, speak. So I just started reciting verses. So as we walked back and forth on this mountain over and over and over, we did this for probably a month. And then after about three weeks, when we walked, the Bible verses just went away. They just, they just left, gone. And then there was just nothing. And then for some reason, when I would walk with this being, I would start talking, but it was like he was talking to me, but I, I couldn't hear him. And yet something in my soul can hear him because I would walk, I could hear my footsteps. Then suddenly I would say, mm-hmm, yes, I do understand. Then I'd walk again, there'd be silence. Then I'd say, Yes, but if I do it that way, will it create a problem? Then I'd walk, there'd be silence. Yes, I understand that I can do it. I can do it. Then there'd be silence and we'd be walking. So this being had a way of communicating with me where I could answer him, but I wasn't hearing what he's saying. I, I don't understand what kind of being this is that he can talk to me, I can respond to him, but I, I can't hear any words. So I'm walking with him for probably, this is like two months. And after two months, I start realizing this is God. <laughs> this is, this is the, this ain't, this ain't what you find in church. It's like the real one. This is the big guy. <laughs> That's why I started realizing this, this is the big guy. So while I'm walking with him, he's like speaking to me, but I don't hear anything. 
and yet I'm responding to him in a conversation of words that I can't hear. So I start learning things and I start speaking and I don't know where the knowledge is coming from, but it just starts coming out of me. And I start speaking things about religion, the cosmos, heaven, just knowledge just starts coming out of me. And we did this for probably another two months. And right around month number five, I guess, five months of this, six days a week, right before the sun goes down, every day for six days, a, six days a week for five months. And one day I returned to the mountain, you know, right before the sun gets, you know, when the evening gets cold, cool, I come back to the mountain and I'm expecting him to come. But this time when I come, there's just angels everywhere. Thousands of them all over the mountain, just everywhere. And I'm walking like, what's going on? What, what's special today? What, what is it? <laughs> I didn't know what the special was. And everybody's just looking at me. All the angels just looking at me. I, I didn't know why. They just kept looking at me. So while I'm walking around, they're all looking at me. And then one of them pulls out a robe. And it's not a robe that we see on earth. It, it's just full of light. It's just, it's, it's, it's light. So I'm looking at the, the, the robe. I don't understand the significance of it. And they motion for me to come over to the angels and they put this robe on me. And when they put it on me, I can see, you know, light. You know how you, they put it on me. When I'm looking at you, the light from my chest up in my eyes. So that's what the robe was. It was just full of light and I was wearing it and I was happy. And I couldn't believe that I had a robe that they wear and I was really happy. But the problem was when I put the robe on, they told me to speak. And I just started walking and talking. And the one thing that I learned was they were not all happy for me. They said, if he speaks, he will take the servants. We cannot let him speak. And I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't, I didn't get it. So on that day, everything changed. It was like when, I, when all the angels got to see me, everything changed. So when I left that day and I was happy, one of the angels came to me and said, why don't you tell your family what you've been experiencing for the last five months? Tell everybody you're in the presence of God. Tell them what you see. So I went home and I told everybody what I saw. Within two hours, I was in a mental institution. <laughs> and when they locked me up in a mental institution, I saw all the angels laughing, dancing, celebrating. And I didn't understand it. And they pumped me so full of drugs that I passed out. And when I woke up, I could see all the angels. They were literally like they were partying, just dancing, celebrating. And I was saying, well, I, I don't understand what happened. They said, you're crazy now. You can never be king. I said, who wanted to be king? They said, you were supposed to be. We destroyed you. And they celebrated and they laughed and they danced. And I still didn't understand what that meant. When I got out of the mental institution, everybody said, you're crazy. God doesn't operate like that. God doesn't meet you and walk with you. That, 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 that's, that's not real. And I said, maybe you're right. So I left and went walking. And then suddenly one of the angels came to me and said, I want to give you something. And I said, what is it? They said, you'll know. 
And as I walked, I could still see everybody. I could still see dead people. I could still see angels. I could literally see everything in the afterlife. And I found out the afterlife is exactly like our lives. There's no difference. It's the exact same thing as our life. It's the exact same world. And the more I started seeing the afterlife, the more I could see how they interact with our world. All of us serve the afterlife and we don't even know it. Every last one of us serves the afterlife. We, the living, are basically servants to the afterlife and we don't know it. And the one thing that you'll learn about the afterlife is everything that we've been taught of the afterlife is untrue. Don't get me wrong, Bill, we teach about demons, uh, beings that are evil, that kill you and all that kind of stuff. You have no idea what a demon is. Everything that we've been taught is wrong. In the afterlife, there are demons, but they're not gray. They don't have bat wings. They don't have sawed off teeth. None of that's true. None of it is. And the most devastating thing you'll find out about a demon, though, they still do evil. They still do kill people. They do nothing but evil to people. And here's the thing that's the most devastating about it. Demons do exist, but they're not gray and, you know, sawed off teeth and horns and all that stuff. And demons actually have names. You know what their names are? James, Michelle, Jason, Deborah, Michael, Roger. Demons are those people who lived with us that, I don't know if you've ever had a guy in your neighborhood who was always beating up people, always robbing people, always just ruining people's lives, and that guy ends up getting shot or murdered. That guy does the exact same thing when he's dead. Only he does it to the living. That's who demons are. It's those same people that we knew who were the violent criminals, the violent offenders who end up getting shot or murdered or killed. When, they, when they're dead, they do the exact same thing, but they do it to the living and the living can't see them. The dead uses all of us to do everything. And one of the reasons, believe it or not, they use us the most is religion. The dead can talk to us through our religious beliefs. The dead can't drive a car and yet they have legs and they need to move. The dead can't do anything that we can do. They can't turn on our TV. They can't drive our cars. They can't open our doors, but they can get you to do it. And that's what they use us for. In the afterlife, they still want the same things we want to do. They like going places. They still like to eat. They still like all the things that we like to do. The only difference is they operate in a different structure of time. And the one thing that you'll learn about what people call crazy is the most important thing you'll ever understand in the world. And if you ever know anyone, you'll find that this is the most valuable knowledge you'll ever have. So listen to this. When I saw God and I walk with God, and I could see all these things. The world calls this insanity. They call it crazy. And this really is a judgment against our world. Because in the ancient days, if a man could see God, if a man could hear the voice of angels, if a man could see into the cosmos, he was considered a god, a demigod, an oracle. In our world, if a man can see into the heavens and see God, he's considered insane, crazy. And the one thing you'll learn about psychosis, and this is the best thing you'll ever know, crazy is not really what we think it is. It's actually a blessing from God. You, you just can't see it. Because when you walk into the world, and you see individuals that, not, aren't, that aren't here. For example, if you see the dead that aren't here and you can hear them talking to you, we call that schizophrenia. It's called insanity. 
However, what you don't realize is schizophrenia primarily only attacks intelligent people. It very rarely attacks people who are dumb. Schizophrenia always attacks classical musicians, people who read a lot, people who are mathematicians. It always attacks intelligent people. And the reason why is because if you keep your head on straight, crazy makes you smarter because your mind is bending. For example, in our world, we live in a three-dimensional world, which tells us what is real and what is not. But the one thing you'll find when you walk in the afterlife, their world is exactly like ours. For example, I would sit in my room. I would see a dead man walk in my room. He would look at me and he'd pick up the Bible that I had on, on a chair. And he'd pick it up and he'd turn the page to chapter six of one of the books. And it would say something like, get up, walk. And it would have a page number on it. And I would look at him pick up the book, but then I'd look on the table and my book would still be there. And yet he had my exact same book in his hand and he turned the page. So I'd pick up the book that was actually in my, in our world, turn the page and it was exactly like his book. He would also pick up something else in the room and I would say, how can he pick that up? And it's still laying on the table. What he's showing me is our world exists in two different places. The world that we understand exists here, their world there, and they're both real. So what happens to you is insanity changes your mind. It, it, it opens your mind. It bends your mind. Because what you start learning is that when you're walking and you see people who aren't there, and yet you know they exist, when you hear people talking, and you know they're not there, and you hear them, when you see people interacting with all the inanimate objects around us, and they still can move them, this allows your mind to accept the reality of different dimensions. And when your mind accepts different dimensions, you are no longer bound to the understanding of a human being. Human beings only understand a three-dimensional world. But if you should become crazy, as they call it, or schizophrenic, as they call it, your mind bends because you're now accepting the fact that others can exist in a different dimension. And the more you see it, the more you understand it, your mind bends. It opens. It expands. Your understanding now becomes not a three-dimensional, but it becomes five-dimension, six-dimension, seven dimensions. So as your mind begins to understand these different dimensions, you become 10, 12, 20, 40 times smarter, and you don't even know it. Your mind expands. You're accepting and understanding that the world can't. All these different things that you're seeing tells you your reality is bending. It's expanding. So the more you understand different dimensions, the more you'll understand things that are created in different dimensions. The cosmos, the universe, hieroglyphics. All these things have something to do with creating different dimensions. So the one thing that you'll understand no matter what your beliefs are, if you are willing to stay calm, accept what you're seeing, it makes you smarter. It makes your mind greater. So everything that I experienced up to that point led me to realize my mind was expanding, my knowledge was expanding, and I was getting smarter, which led to the most horrible part of the story. The most horrible part of the story was when I picked up the Bible again, it would be the worst day of my life because when I went to Revelation, I found out I'm the first man to actually open it. It was the worst, most horrifying time 
in my life. And to this day, I have never recovered. 